Ladies and gents, it's that time of the month again. Um, Clockwork Empires has hit another stable branch, or well, I should say, had another release to the stable branch, so we're now up to Alpha 47. Um, as we look at the colony here, I've been playing this one for a couple of hours. Uh, and as usual, I'll start a new colony, I guess, for the subsequent episodes. Uh, but in the first episode of every series, I'll just talk about the new stuff. And I picked this time to talk about the new stuff because an opportune uh, event has occurred. So one of the new things, and I'm just going to pause here for a second, one of the new things um, that was introduced to Clockwork Empires in one of the Alpha 46 experimental builds was the Trade Depot, which was Alpha 46A or B or something. Uh, so it's been fully implemented here in uh, the latest stable branch release, Alpha 47, and I've actually built that office here. Um, there's a trade interface. So now you can trade your goods with uh, other foreign national powers. So like the Stalmark or the Novo Rus and those guys. As you can see, um, on the right hand side, I have my list of trade commodities and when traders arrive and they're actually on their way. So I had notification that I have traders incoming. Their goods for trade will appear in the left hand side. And like Civ 5 and a bit like Door Fortress, you'll balance out what you're giving and getting and hopefully you'll trade for things you need. As you can see, I can designate things to be trade goods. So like this chunk of gold here. When I highlight it to be a trade good, it turns kind of green. It, it, it's a little bit hard to see because gold is kind of yellow. Uh, what don't I need? I don't need this ceramics workbench. For some reason I built two. So I'll designate you as a trade good, but not you because I need you as timber. Okay, this is a little bit fiddly. You are not a trade good. Can't cancel designation. Oh well, you are a trade good. Anyway, so with those highlighted, for instance, they now appear in the as oh and my traders the friendly stalmarkian traders i have so much i actually found a gold deposit here and this is actually the site of a gold mine unfortunately it looks like the t the traders actually brought gold with them so i'm guessing they won't want won't also want gold anyway we can see how uh oh what do i need i'll bet you want my shiny native gold and hopefully you want this ceramics workbench because I want to trade it. I'm going to keep that plank though. Now each of these things has a trade value as you can see by mousing over. Uh, okay, not in this interface, but here in your stockpile, right? It gives you their trade value. And um, so as long as the trade value is roughly equal, there's a good chance they will accept it. Now I don't want gold ingots. I do need hematite actually, because I haven't set up the mine. Iron pipes would always be nice. Don't need planks as such. But some copper goods would also be nice, and that far exceeds what I'm able to offer. So let's dial back the copper request a bit. There we go. Uh, I think they're getting this a uh, little bit better. Oh, guten tag. Where there is deals to be made, so are we. Lenny Bergman of the Freistadt Kohlberg Handelhaus. I propose a trade. Pleasure doing with your business with ye. And uh, that's that. So the trade, I believe the trade was accepted. And what they're going to do now is they're going to hang around for a little bit. Then they depart. When they eventually depart, they'll take the things that I didn't trade for. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's a demonstration of the trade interface. So that's how, that's how things are traded. Um, but there have been implement the new features basically have been tied into the trade process as well uh, Okay, so <laughs> Bigger picture big new things in this uh, particular release The big one is of course the trade depot, which I just mentioned uh, There have been changes also to the way the foreign office works, which I can't actually show you because I didn't build one this time Oh got new immigrants sure get to work and uh, food. Food has seen some significant overhauling again. So if we take a look at the kitchen over here, we can see now that, uh, well, I don't have all the modules necessary to build everything. 
Uh, but new things. The it's now possible to make sausages, a bushel of sausages. You need raw steak for that. Steak which can come from the aurochs or uh, the death worms if you're here in the jungle, or uh, giant beetles. I oh wait, no, those give you giant beetle steak. Anyway, meat. You use meat to make sausages. It takes two meat to make a one bushel of sausages. So that's one consideration. Uh, these are different kinds of stews. Now this is tinned beef. It now requires iron and iron ingot, which you make at the metalworks, as well as meat. And again, it's it requires more resources than food you get out of it. The benefit of these more involved... Okay, so there are multiple benefits to these more involved foods now. Same thing with all the fungus and berry recipes to make um, berry preserves. And actually it's called a berry medley because... All the berry recipes have been combined into one. So berry medley will accept any of the berries. So the lingonberry and the Saskatoon berry. Um, yes, those go, those, any number of those can contribute to a berry medley, which requires a glass jar, which you actually make here at the ceramics workshop. We see here, you make glass out of sand and then you turn glass into bottles. And once you have bottles, which get stocked up here, uh, let's see. I've got one unit of glass pane, for instance. So I'll make a unit of glass bottles. Uh, anyway, yes, the berry medley and uh, things like the caviar. Basically, food now has, food now sees uh, class divisions, the same way beds, bedding sees class divisions. So a middle class overseer will be less than happy sleeping in a common laborer's cot and will always seek to sleep in a uh, in a middle-class bed. Same thing goes for food. Your aristocrats and overseers will want your more expensive foods. Um, typically the ones that you make, one food requires two inputs and uh, they'll be less satisfied. I mean, they'll still eat it, of course, but they'll be less satisfied. So that's a little bit of complexity added to the, f uh, the food system, but also your more expensive foods are now suitable as trade goods. So they actually have some value as trade in the trade interface. Uh, so that's something new to consider. Tinned meat, for instance, is quite valuable in trade terms. And uh, here we have, I've just made a unit of glass bottles here, ready to be filled up, well, if my kitchen had a workbench, which um, actually I'd probably order one of those up. This is me demonstrating the module system again. I order a workbench from here and I go into this interface and actually place a workbench and I should have made this kitchen bigger. Uh, yeah, so that's the trade depot and the food system. And I'm getting a new overseer. Now changes to the foreign office. Um, if you looked at the foreign office interface in previous revisions, you'd see that um, there was no, basically there are no, there's no interaction with the foreign national powers. Again, the uh, Le Republique, the Novo Rus, and the Stalmark. So that's been added into the foreign office. Now you can have uh, pre essentially prestige. Uh, basically the state of your relations goes up and down with them the same way it goes up and down with the empire and also the bandits. And like those two, you can also request favors or uh, interactions with them by spending uh, those points. Uh, basically, so the the foreign office is more or less complete now. Uh, yeah, so because of the way that works now, the the old prestige mechanic has been uh, is completely deprecated. So it no longer has any meaning for the game. You don't you'll notice that if we look at the top bar here, there's no longer an entry for uh, earning stars or prestige with the empire. That's been completely rolled into the foreign office system. Uh, another side note, the trade office actually does not require, I mean, I put a standing desk in here, but the trade office does not actually require an overseer. It did up until I think the last, mm, the last uh, experimental release. Uh, and then uh, the devs decided it, it was, you, you don't need to permanently assign an overseer there because trade missions only arrive very occasionally. Also, my game seems to have stalled. I, I'm not paused here, actually. Uh, 
Yeah, well, Alpha... So this is Alpha 47. It's a little bit buggy. Um, just bear with me as I finish talking over the changes. And maybe you can admire my colony. Um, down here, I was actually very short on stone. So I was happy to locate a stone quarry. So I've built the stone quarry here. Um, what else do we need? Oh, yes. Uh, because of the changes to the food system... Um, the exhaustion chance of forageables has been lowered. So basically, when you have berry bushes and uh, coconut palms and things, there was, I believe, a 40% chance that after being foraged uh, for their food, they would not grow back. So you could probably pick them a couple of times and they would no longer produce food. That's been lowered significantly. I don't know the exact percentage. Um, but because so many of the more involved recipes now require uh, berries and other forageables more regularly. Uh, in order to aid in that, um, the chance that they will become exhausted has been lowered. So you'll have a more reliable source of forageables for longer. Not forever, there's still a chance they will be exhausted. Um, so all the berry recipes have been rolled into one. All the pies, the various pies have all been ro also rolled into one. Um, Oh, and minor changes to the way the military works. So now a squad's commander adds bonus damage to uh, basically the firearms damage that soldiers under him do. Red coats, uh, in an effort to further differentiate them from untrained militia, red coats also do more damage than militia. So it's always best to. It's always basically better for soldiers to be trained. And because so many uh, so many recipes now require glass. All, and there are now many more uses for glass in windows and furniture and also bottles for uh, the production of bottled goods for trade and things like that. Um, if you build a mine in a position that is basically a mine put anywhere will produce, will probably produce sand and clay, which is used to make glass. Um, if you build it near a, a node, so if we look here, his little golden carrot here, the mineralogy reports. I guess it's never, it's not ex explicitly documented, but basically building a mine shaft near one of those. So within between, the range is somewhere between uh, 10 and 16 squares from, um, from miner mineralogy node, right? And that will influence what a nearby mine shaft produces. So build a mineshaft close to this node, or in fact, uh, well, this node, for instance, it will produce stone because the mineralogy report revealed that this was a source of stone. And over here, uh, the one over here would produce gold because I had surveyed it for uh, as gold earlier. Uh, if you don't, pr if you don't put it down anywhere near one of those, then it'll produce sand and clay. So that's just a gameplay concession. Um, and you have a more reliable source of sand now. Prior to that, it was very, very difficult to obtain sand, and as such, as a result, glass goods were very rare. Um, so that's a very quick look at all the stuff that's been changed, and I'm sorry that the <laughs> gameplay seems to have frozen here. Hopefully this doesn't happen during my playthrough. Uh, and yeah, so that was episode one. Uh, from this point forward, I'll be starting a new colony. And, uh, oh, but before I go, uh, I do have something to show you. So if you'll direct your attentions to the right side of the screen, you'll see a glowing green uh, skeleton walking around. That's actually the skeleton of Geyer Turnip. Uh, you can actually see his dead body at the far right of the screen. He was murdered by fishmen, and then night fell, and everyone was too busy to bury him. Uh, this occurred earlier on in the playthrough. And what happened here is, yeah, the specter of Geyer Turnip is taking it upon himself to tell the other colonists about his murder. Uh, this is the first time I'd actually caught footage of the ghosts and specters, which were introduced a couple of stable revisions ago. Uh, yeah, I thought this would just be cool to show you. As you can see, the colonists are not too happy about being informed uh, of someone's murder by that murder, uh, the murdered's ghost. Um, but, uh, as we can see, uh, 
Elnora Steel Sold Solder is burying poor Geyer's body. If we actually look at the skeleton's desire, we can see that he wants to tell people about his death so that someone will bury his body. And he's making everyone crazy. And see that purple glow that happened behind the uh, behind the information pane? Oh, what was that? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, someone's seen a ghost. So there you go. Uh, and uh, that's what a specter looks like, just in case, like me, you hadn't seen one before. So there we have it. Uh, that's what we have lined up for my look at Alpha 47. Uh, again, I'll be starting the new colony next episode. Uh, the, the stable branch release went out just yesterday, which was unusual because it's Monday and not the middle of the week, but it was the middle of the month, so it was about that time. Uh, again, this is an alpha, so there will be bugs, things will break, and sound might go out. That's been a recurring problem this patch. Uh, but yeah, hopefully we can see what the new stuff looks like. So, if you're interested, tune in for next episode. Otherwise, thanks very much for watching this one. My name's Alfred, the game is Clockwork Empires. Uh, check it out on Steam if you're so inclined. I'll see you later.